Please pray with me. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, we have finally made our way through December to the fourth weekend or Sunday in Advent. And so these past three weeks, we have worked through the theme of prepare, and we've talked about a variety of ways to prepare for the coming of Christ. The first week, we were told in Scripture to watch, to stay awake, to be alert in case we miss the coming. The second week, we considered what it meant in order to listen to prepare for Christ and to listen to God even in our own daily lives for Christ coming to us to speak to us in our own daily lives. And last week, week three, we heard the Advent candle lighters remind us that we need to speak in preparation. Just as John the Baptist came and spoke as the one, a voice crying out from the desert, prepare the way of the Lord. And so we are called also to speak of the coming of Christ. Today's focus then is on responding our fourth week in Advent. But before we talk a little more about that, I want to dig into our Old Testament reading from 2 Samuel this morning, because it's a text that's just rich with depth and history and, um, and a covenant made with David that is very similar, if not exactly the same, as the covenant made with Abraham way back in the very beginning. So Samuel, Samuel was a prophet in the oldest times of the Israelite nation. In fact, he was born and served during the time of the judges. There was no king when Samuel was born and when he first began um, his, his uh, ministry as a prophet for God. Um, and then Saul came in to be the king. In fact, Samuel's that prophet that anointed Saul to be the first king according to what God commanded. But Samuel's story actually happens all the way back at the very beginning of uh, the Bible, uh, Bible book for Samuel. That makes sense, right? Samuel starts with Samuel. Um, and so this starts with his mother, Hannah. And Hannah does not have, um, she does not have the ability to have children. She is barren, a lot like Elizabeth, a lot like Sarah. Um, and so there's a lot of parallels between her and women of the rest of the Bible, isn't there? She is so desperate to have a child. In that time, it was really important for the women to bear children, especially sons. And she wants this child so badly. So they go to a festival in Jerusalem, and she is seen to be praying so fervently they, they think she's drunk. But she is just praying so fervently that if the Lord will give her a child, then when it is time, she will give that child back to the Lord to serve in the temple. And so Samuel is born, and at the appropriate time, she takes Samuel and she brings him to Eli, and Eli finishes his training in the temple. And now one of the very first things that Samuel's preparation to be a priest involved was, guess what, you, you guessed it, listening. Listening. One night he hears God call to him, but he doesn't yet know about the Lord uh, calling to people. And so he hears, he hears his name, and he gets up, and he runs straight to Eli, and he responds, here am I. And Eli's like, what? No, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. You're, you're, you're hearing things. So Samuel goes back to sleep, and so then the Lord calls again, and he goes running to Eli, and Eli's like, nope, not me. Go back to bed. A third time, the Lord calls to Samuel, and Samuel runs and says, here I am, and Eli's like, okay. I get what's going on. Now I know what's going on. Go back to bed, and when you hear that call again, answer, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel does as he is instructed and thus receives his first message to be uh, a prophet for God. Unfortunately, it's kind of a hard message to give Eli, but nonetheless, it's his first message because he's finally listened and learned to listen to God's call. So all the words that we hear in the story, listen, Samuel listens, God speaks, Samuel responds. Because listening for God and to God from the very beginning makes no sense unless you actually act upon what God calls you to do. So later on in 1 Samuel, unfortunately Saul, this first anointed king, um, gets too involved in his own power and his strength. He kind of gets a little tainted by that and uh, begins to rely on it 
more than God's power and strength and God's call. And so God says, you know what, it's time for a new king. So he calls up Samuel and says, okay, you need to anoint a new king. So Samuel goes to meet with Jesse. And Jesse brings out his sons and presents them one after the other. And each one goes by and God says, not this one, not this one, nope, not this one. And then finally Samuel says, are there any other sons? And Jesse says, well, you know, there's David. He's the shepherd guy out in the, out in the fields. But, I mean, I guess we could bring him in. And so they go in and get him. And David comes in and he passes by and uh, God says, this is the one. This is the new king. Uh, David is a, he's a lowly shepherd. So another parallel that we hear in scripture at this time of year. And he's anointed to follow King, King Saul. So now, after knowing all of that, we fast forward to today's passage. There's been a lot of things happening in between. But now finally, um, David is in, he's settled in this house. We're told he's settled and he has been given rest from all his enemies and he calls to Nathan, Samuel's re, uh, replacement as a prophet. So now it's David is king and Nathan is the prophet. And he calls to him and he's confused about why he's sitting in this really beautiful, great big palace or house made of cedar when the ark of God stays outside in a tent. He doesn't think that seems very right. This is because, and the ark is out there because of the first set of rules given last week. Uh, Pastor Steve referred to the book of Leviticus where the Israelites had come from Egypt and they were out in the desert and God gives them all these rules and directions and, and instructions. And so one of those things is to build a separate tent for the ark of God and that's where it is. But then when they go, wherever they go, they just pick up the tent and the ark and they take it with them, right? So God goes with them everywhere they go. And this is all happening right after they've been freed from Egypt. These people were nomadic. They moved from place to place. It was never a set place like the temple. So David decides he's going to build a permanent place for the ark, but the Lord has other ideas and says, I've not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people from Egypt to this day, but I've been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. And so then God goes on to question, you know, I didn't ever say I wanted a house, right? And of course the answer is no. This is quite a parallel to Jesus himself, isn't it, in the Gospels? Jesus tells the disciples he has no home, that he's always moving about, that he never stays in the same place. Jesus goes to meet the people where they live and is always moving. So the second half of today's Old Testament reads, um, read, reading parallels more. The Lord tells David, I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed no more. This covenant is such, so much similarity with the covenant that God makes with Abraham for descendants and land all the way back from the very beginning. So God is renewing that covenant with David. And God states in this passage, I have been with you wherever you went. This whole reading points to the fact that David's house is going to be forever. I will make for you a house that lasts forever. And this, of course, then points to Jesus because who is Jesus' ancestor? It's David. In fact, Joseph comes from the house of David. And so Jesus finally comes and permanently solidifies that house of God forever. From this passage, we learn that God listens to the people and that the people have learned to listen to God. Maybe not always, but definitely a lot of the time. God is always present with them in the desert with David as king in exile after the kingdom split later. As when Isaiah prophesies when they're in exile and then when they're home again. Christ comes to be with the people right where they are and to travel with them without a home right where they are. It's been a series of listening, speaking, and responding that has led them to this point. So this morning now, then, we come to the gospel and the story of Mary visited by the angel who tells her of this pregnancy that she is going to be 
uh, the mother of the Son of God, she is literally going to bear Christ into the world. Mary's response, if we look back to Luke uh, 1, verse 38, is another parallel to what we heard earlier in the beginning of Samuel, right? Mary responds with, here am I. Just as Samuel responded to God, here am I. Speak, your servant is listening. Mary has been listening her whole life. She would have listened to the lessons of the Old Testament. She would have less learned the, the, the stories of the people of her whole life. She would have been faithful her whole life. And so then her response echoes the voices of David and Isaiah and Abraham and all those who have gone before her. Mary's been listening in preparation as her ancestors listened for the word of God. But now we get to today's theme. Mary doesn't just listen. Mary responds. Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Mary fully and boldly accepts what God has called her to do. Just as Abraham did, just as Moses and David and Isaiah and all those others that have preceded her in the faith. And so this is the whole point, isn't it? That in preparing by watching and waiting and listening and speaking, we also have to be ready to respond, to act in faith. What good is it for us to have faith if, we don't, if, it, if what we hear doesn't transform what we do in our lives, in our living, the way that we live, the way that we forgive, and the way that we love, just as Christ has loved us? So finally, Paul sums up the way in which we should act in response. Paul reminds us that our response, that our action is all for God and all in response to God. So God is due all the glory. We're called to respond, but not in a way that Saul does, relying on our own strength and our own power, but in a way that points to God just like Mary does, in full faith of God's strength and power, giving God the glory. So as we close this Advent season, as we're reminded to watch and listen and speak and respond, we're also reminded of God's transforming love. We are called to seek God and serve others. We are called to be the people of God in sight, hearing, speaking, and action. And with this preparation, we now will soon celebrate the coming of Christ into the world. Amen.